Welcome to today's conversation with Sarah Eckhart, a virtual event brought to you by the Texas Tribune. I'm Cassie Pollock, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. While the Tribune has paused our in-person live events, we're moving the conversation online with an ongoing series of virtual events. I'm here today with Texas Senate candidate and former Travis County Judge Sarah Eckhart. We'll be discussing her 2020 campaign and how it's developed in light of recent events until about 8.45 this morning. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors for supporting today's conversation, AT&T, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas, Texas 2036, and Walmart. We also want to thank KXAN and KPRC2 for their media support. Though donors and corporate sponsors underwrite our events, they play no role in determining the content, panelists, or line of questioning. Finally, I'd like to introduce Judge Eckert. 2015, Judge Eckert became Travis County's first female county judge. In March, she declared her candidacy for Senate District 14, a seat that has been left vacant by former Senator Kirk Watson. Previously, Eckhart spent eight years as an assistant Travis County attorney and was elected to represent Precinct 2 on the County Commissioner's Court in 2006. She's also served as vice chair of the membership on the Texas Conference of Urban Counties Board of Directors. Judge Eckhart, thank you so much for uh, being with us here today. How are you doing? Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Cassie, and we were talking before. It's nice to meet you in person. Right. This is uh, definitely the new norm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I know that uh, you've obviously are coming out of a crazy past few months professionally with uh, you, your experiences as county judge, and we're definitely going to divide, dive into that in a few minutes. But um, I wanted to first just turn to your Senate campaign, and I wanted you to kind of uh, explain for us and explain for everybody who's uh, watching right now, uh, why are you running? Uh, you know, what's driving you to transition from county level work to being part of a uh, Republican majority Senate? Sure. Um, I love my job. I, I've loved every minute of being a Travis County judge, and I'm always going to miss that. Um, but I really I really like to solve problems and get things done. And I think that the state Senate could use a little bit of that right now. Um, at the local level, we've done a really good job working uh, through collaborative leadership. Um, we find ways to cross partisan divides, geographic divides even uh, to get things done. And we've really committed. Uh, we don't always get along and we don't always agree at first, but we have a commitment locally to sit down at the table and to keep talking until we find a way to move forward together. And I think um, I'd like to take a little bit of that to the state Senate. Yeah, and, um, you know, kind of transitioning or, you know, 2015 elected first county, first female county judge in Travis County. And uh, that would also be the same case if you're elected to the state Senate seat. You would be the first female ever to represent SD14. Um, how much do you think that message is resonating with voters in the district right now? I think it, it, it does resonate. And certainly we need more of that at the state Senate since there's only nine uh, female senators in a body of 31. Um, so women in leadership is still a novelty at the state level. But at the local level, um, Bastrop and Travis counties are no stranger to women in leadership. Um, half of the commissioners in Bastrop and in Travis County are women. Uh, a majority of the of the judges in Bastrop and Travis County are women. So um, Central Texas is is comfortable and supportive of women in leadership positions. And I'd like to take some of that to the Senate. Right. Uh, this is a reader question that I wanted to weave in uh, just before we kind of continue on with your campaign uh, side of questioning. And this is from John. Uh, and it's kind of actually tapping into what you're saying now. Given that working with legislators uh, from both sides and relationships and experience will be critically important during redistricting and budgeting next session, which we'll get into also later this conversation. Why do you think you are the best candidate for the Senate seat? There are six candidates in the race, and I'll ask you a question on that after. But uh, let's go ahead and answer John's question. Sure. I I I. I think that I am a, a solid choice uh, to succeed Senator Watson in this position. Senator Watson really set the standard for reaching across the aisle, getting beyond partisan politics to really provide a, 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 a template for progress. Um, and I'd like to build on that and expand our ability to really get down to work. Uh, I don't want to go to the Texas Senate to fight. I want to go to the Texas Senate to work. 
And I think that Republicans and Democrats want to uh, want to see work done. I think we're all a little tired of watching our representatives fight. We want to see our representatives actually sit down, work together and work for us. Uh, this election has been set for uh, mid-July, uh, aside from, you know, uh, well, you know, before COVID, I should say it was going to be in early May. Does an July, does a July election date uh, change, like actually change anything about the race, the dynamics of your candidacy, just the field in general? It, it certainly has changed the dynamics for me, and it's nothing I could have expected. I, I didn't expect Senator Watson's retirement. I don't think anyone did. And so I uh, decided to run before COVID-19 had hit the shores of the United States, or at least before we knew it had. So nobody expected COVID-19 either. Um, so a July race meant that I needed to take a good hard look at what my community really needed from me. And I decided that I was going to announce my candidacy and put it on hold while I stayed as county judge in order to in order to keep our emergency response team together as long as I possibly could. And I'm really grateful that the commissioner's court and Judge Bisco wanted me to do that. And so now I am the special assistant to Judge Bisco in response and recovery to COVID-19. Um, so my campaign is getting started a little late and it is a challenge to fit campaigning in around my work, but I've got to do this work. Um, if I lose a Senate race because I was responding to my community's need in a pandemic, I will sleep well at night. Right. And uh, we will get to county judge stuff here in a little bit, but staying on SD 14 and, and the race in general, uh, you know, I don't think it surprises anyone that the that the Senate seat has been a historically Democratic leaning district uh, district. There are six candidates in the race. Uh, you're one of two Democrats. There's also two Republicans, a libertarian and an independent candidate. Are you anticipating a runoff just given that there are going to be six candidates on the ballot? You know, a runoff, of course, is statistically possible, but I think that um, I, I think that we will have a decision on July 14th. Um, my guts tell me that that we will be in a good place to have a decision and be able to move forward with solid representation for the people of Senate District 14 starting July 15th. Um, I know this district well. And this district, the people of Senate District 14 know me well and they know the quality of my work. And so I think I'm uh, in a good position to to win this. Got it. And on that note, you and State Representative Eddie Rodriguez are seen as widely seen as the two most competitive candidates in the race. Uh, he's, of course, running on his 18 years of experience at the legislature. Uh, how are you differentiating yourself from that just when you're talking with voters, uh, probably virtually at this point? Uh, what are you leaning on to try to explain the difference to them? Um, I don't want to talk about any of my opponent's uh, qualifications so much as I want to highlight my qualifications. So I'm a lawyer, 22 years, um, and I also have a master's of public affairs. I have been an adjunct professor at the University of Texas LBJ School teaching uh, public affairs. And then as a lawyer, of course, um, I have been a prosecutor and a commissioner and also the chief executive and administrator of a county with 1.3 million people in it. So I, in my experience, I have often seen that some legislature, uh, some legislators um, don't have the real world experience to really know what happens to their bill after it leaves the building. But I do. I'm not only a policymaker, I'm also a practitioner. So I know what happens when the rubber meets the road. And mm -hmm. I've had to make the tough decisions to figure out how to get people served. And so I'm hoping to take that to the Texas Senate. Got it. Specifically on uh, campaigning here, you know, this race, we're talking about a July election date. It's, uh, you know, not what anybody was really anticipating here. And so this is kind of just turning to your campaign operations. Are you as a campaign having to rejigger your plan to motivate uh, you know, your base to go to the polls at this point? Are you hearing any like what's your sense about how voters feel, uh, you know, given the state of everything having to go, uh, you know, I guess, there's a lawsuit panning out right now in the courts. But as of now, uh, going to the polls in person and having to cast a ballot in this race. 
No, oh, absolutely. I, um, there, there's a lawsuit going on right now, which curiously, um, our elections administrator, Dana de Beauvoir, is a named defendant in the lawsuit, even though Travis County and Dana specifically are huge proponents for what the plaintiffs are trying to get done, which is an expanded uh, access to vote by mail. We Everyone's scared and it is absolutely appropriate to be scared. It's rational fear. And so uh, an expanded voter uh, vote by mail is absolutely necessary. But even before COVID-19, we have been uh, concerned with a growing movement to disenfranchise people and to scare them away from the polls. So, um, yes, I am very concerned about voter participation in this mm-hmm. race. And we will be doing everything we can through a virtual campaign to uh, give people good quality information that is the best medical science uh that we can possibly provide so that people know how to keep themselves safe and vote. (laughs) So a virtual campaign is a challenge, but there's also some benefits to it. Um, It's cheaper. uh, There's less flash and more substance Mm. in virtual campaign space, I think. And um, everyone's having to adapt. So campaigns are adapting too. Yeah. And on that note, virtual campaigning, I know that you yourself are pretty active on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. How is your campaign trying to replicate things like door knocking and block walking and town halls? I've actually had uh, I started virtual door knocks where I literally stood at the door and my daughter would open it and then I would videotape my my spiel. Um, also, we uh, been, have been doing videos from my attic, my Emily Dickinson attic. Uh, doing updates, periodic updates on what's happening in COVID-19 world. Um, and also we're having Zoom parties. As you may know, I do coffee jolts uh, the, the, during normal times, not COVID-19. Um, I would do coffee jolts the third Thursday of every month. We're now doing them every Thursday, along with a policy pint on Friday afternoons. Uh, and those are Zoom parties. People will jump on Zoom and we'll talk about policy. I get more juice out of those kinds of events, um, whether they're virtual or in person. They're like think tanks for me. Mm-hmm. I get great ideas from the people who come to those and say, here's my problem or here's my idea or here's my criticism. Um, it's it's really gratifying to me. And on fundraising, I mean, what's it been like trying to raise money for this campaign during a global pandemic? Has this economic downturn that we've seen, you know, practically happen overnight, has that turned off the taps of typical Democrat donors that you may have gone to otherwise? Everybody is in a space of uncertainty economically. So definitely people are thinking twice about how they want to spend their money. Um, And I completely understand that and respect it. I'm not looking to buy a Texas Senate seat. I'm looking to earn one. And so support is the most important thing to me. Certainly there has to be uh, enough resources to get out, uh, uh, get out the the vote and get out the message. And I'm confident that we will have the resources to do that. But again, I'm not looking to buy the seat. I'm looking to earn. Right. Let's um, move over just to a set of questions about uh, if you end up do winning election to this Texas Senate seat. You know, you're talking a lot about being an effective uh, senator, working with people, getting things done. Uh, so how do you plan to work with GOP senators? Uh, you know, it is a GOP majority Senate legislature. There's a Republican governor. Uh, and, you know, to that to that end, working with other Republican leaders, just given past dust ups that you've had as a Democrat official. You know, I find a lot of creativity in um, in our our conflict. Um, conflict is not a bad thing. That's what democracy is about. And I have uh, good friends in both parties. Um, I've worked across the aisle as uh, a member of the Conference of Urban Counties. Uh, I've worked across the aisle in developing the relationships with my county judges that surround Travis County. Um, certainly the Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization is a bipartisan and sometimes, frankly, partisan organization in which I have made solid friends. I have a personal philosophy that everybody is welcome and nobody is an enemy forever. A person who 
that's against you one day may be your best ally on the issue the next day, mm-hmm. uh, or on a different issue the next day. It's true there's only 12 Democrats in a body of 31, but everybody wants to govern. Everybody wants to make life better for their constituents. And um, I think back to Senator Watson saying, before anyone starts arguing, let's first talk about the five things we agree on. And if we can start there, then we can use that as a uh, navigation to progress. And that will guide our work. Yeah. Obviously, one thing that's going to be really central to next session, you're already seeing a lot of talk about it now, is this uh, projected budget shortfall, uh, just, again, given the pandemic and, and what that's done to the state economy. Uh, Finance Chair Jane Nelson, a Republican from Fire Mound, has already suggested uh, that she intends to use uh, zero-based budgeting uh, as her approach, starting agencies at zero and going from there. Uh, is that uh, the approach that needs to be taken in your book, or is, is that a good starting point? Well, Jane Nelson is an extremely talented senator and very powerful over the Finance Committee. But I would say that with regard to zero based budgeting, um, I know that technique well. And you can't zero out Texans education, health care and well-being. So in education, we absolutely must um We must fund education with ongoing resources. We cannot plug holes with one time resources any longer. Um, That just kicks the can down the road. In healthcare, we, we must get Medicaid. We, we, we've earned it and we deserve it and we should take it. (laughs) And then in well-being, one thing COVID-19 has illustrated in, in, in a deep way is that you can't be pro-business without being pro-worker. And what our Texas workforce needs, our Texas workforce needs health care, child care, and it needs workforce training so that we can keep up to speed with the changing economy. Mm-hmm. This is uh, another reader question from Chris this time. Uh, former Senator Kirk Watson was a leader on higher education issues, among others. What's your policy prescription for Texas higher ed? And to what extent do you see yourself involved in higher ed policy if you were to win the seat? I would be absolutely involved in higher ed. You know, the University of Texas has been an indispensable partner uh, helping us through COVID-19 by modeling the facts on the ground and giving us a glimpse of what scenarios we might face in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, without that kind of partnership, we would be flying blind. Um, as a proud graduate with two advanced degrees from the University of Texas, Um, Also, we have relied so heavily on the talent that the University of Texas pumps out into our community. And the same is true for the entire university system, um, all of our state universities. Um, I'm a big believer in our uh, um, community colleges as well. We we must invest in our future generations by investing in public education, K through 12, as well as our community colleges and our our uh, four year institutions. Yeah. Uh, our, our economic livelihood depends on it. Yeah. Um, here's a kind of a interesting question. Uh, what would be the first bill that you would want to file as a state senator? And. Has whatever that bill uh, is, has that changed since COVID? I guess what I'm trying to get at here is how much has COVID changed the priorities that you want to be focused on as a state senator? Well, you know, it hasn't so much changed the priorities as the order that I would take the priorities, if that makes sense. So before COVID-19, and I can only speculate, but I think before COVID-19, the very first bill that I would want to file Uh, I would want to go to Representative Collier, check in with her first thing and then refile the bill that she and Senator Watson had last session uh, to make uh, sexual assault victims safer um, by clearing up the definition of consent. Um, I would certainly want to pick up where Senator Watson left off uh, with regard to the redevelopment of uh, Austin State Hospital. Mental health care and behavioral health care are absolutely essential um, for our overall health care. It's also absolutely essential to uh, reforming our criminal justice system. So that is where I probably would have started. But for COVID-19, that's not to say I won't still concentrate 
very heavily in those areas. But right now, I think the first order of business in the Senate is to to uh, scrub the books, look for every opportunity inside statute and the Texas Administrative Code to speed assistance to our families that are struggling to survive economically under COVID-19. I would be looking for every way to speed SNAP eligibility, to expand uh, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, to get child care and training to people who are having to switch to completely different careers uh, or adapt to their current career. Um, looking for broadband expansion into rural areas. 60% of Bastrop has no broadband. Right. Um, so I think the first order of business is to look for every way we can speed uh, assistance to those families that are struggling. This is another uh, question from an audience member, Craig. Uh, according to a study done in December 2019 by the Texas Retired uh, Teachers, uh, or I'm sorry, by TRS, Texas Retired Teachers have the worst benefits of any state. What actions would you take as a state senator to improve the conditions of retired teachers? You know, I want to back up for a moment because I, um, as a practitioner, I like to focus first on what the big issue is and solve that problem. In solving that problem, it's a series of other issues. Um, teacher retirement is part of it. Teacher pay while they're in the saddle is part of it. Um, we have got to solve our funding issue around public education. Um, I can't say it enough. It is absolutely vital that we provide a sustaining financial mechanism for K through 12 and actually pre-K as well throughout the state of Texas. Um, public education was the most liberating thing that has happened to our society. Mm. Cannot let it go. Um, so absolutely teacher retirement should be looked at as part of that. You can't get good teachers if they don't think that they're going to have good retirement, <laughs> people will not stay in that career. Um, we will have 20 and 30 year old teachers, but they'll leave to go do something else when they realize that their retirement isn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely a part of the program uh, to to make our educational system uh, appropriately funded, resilient and proud. This is uh, another issues based question from another reader, and I'm just trying to group all these together at the same time so that we don't have to go back and forth. Uh, this one's from Pat, and it's about the criminal justice system. Uh, mm -hmm. Pat wants to know what uh, work you would want to do or what actions you'd like to take on reforming uh, that system in Texas as a state senator. The criminal justice system is a sharp and heavy sword. It's a. Um, um, you just don't swing it at just anyone. <laughs> and we swing that sharp, heavy and very expensive sword at people who are not a public safety threat. We swing it at people who are suffering with addiction, who are suffering with poverty, who are suffering with mental illness. And that needs to stop. Uh, not only is it unjust in the extreme, um, it's also expensive and we need to completely reform it. Um, I am well versed in what the reforms need to be. I've pulled up the first ever public defender's office in Travis County, uh, and that's going live over the course of the next budget year. And I'm super excited by that. Um, we have uh, we dove in quickly, uh, not quickly enough, frankly, but we did dive in quickly when the district attorney's office blew the whistle on uh, the Austin Police Department's forensic lab. Um, we called in the state for assistance there, actually, closed down the lab and are in the process of reforming it. Um, there is a lot of reform that needs to be done, frankly. Um, our jail population has been cut in half. Even before COVID-19, our jail population was um, was lower than it had been since 2009. So that was pre-COVID-19. Um, there are some good things happening, but we have a lot more work to do. And the work is at the state level. We've done great things here. Now I need to go to the state and uh, continue the work. 
Thank you. Uh, let's now switch or kind of switch gears here to your time as county judge, especially over the past few months as uh, you've helped uh, the county and, and the community respond to the, the coronavirus. I guess one of my first questions is, how do you think uh, Republican state leaders have, have so far handled the response? I'm talking about the timeline that the governor is using uh, to phase in. Uh, uh, you know, to reopen the economy in phases. Uh, would you have done that differently? I guess I'm just looking kind of for your, uh, your take on all of this. You know, the, the state response has been a bit of a mixed bag. Um, um, we have at the local level a lot of experience with disaster. Um, our team has experienced drought, uh, two deadly floods, wildfires, uh, terrorist bombings, domestic terrorism, even an assassin, assassination attempt on one of our district judges. Mm. So we unfortunately have a lot of experience with this kind of thing. And through that experience, we know that the state will not be leading the charge. The locals lead the charge. But we have really good relationships with state agencies that join us, um, like the Texas Department of Emergency Management, for instance. Um, so we've done pretty well. And early on, uh, the governor made statements that looked like we were going to have an all hands on deck uh, kind of response, that we would transcend partisanship uh, to do what needed to get done. And we were happy about that. But recently, something has spooked the governor. And he's begun making statements and taking actions that are... Um, that divide us, they're confusing, and they're scaring us. I don't think he intends to scare us. Um, all of us are scared. Um, there's reason to be afraid. Right. So I think there's an opportunity for us to get back to an all-hands-on-deck uh, approach that's data-driven, because all of us are scared, but some of us are going to need to be brave and stay the course. Uh, I think we can get there, but I am concerned about recent uh, recent actions. Right. And you know, you're saying data driven decisions here. I mean, the governor has said that he's relying on doctors and data uh, to kind of drive uh, his actions and his announcements. I know that there's a fair amount of debate uh, coming from pretty much everyone on that. Uh, would you be using different met metrics uh, to help guide the, the reopening process than what the governor uh, is using? I would not. The metrics are the metrics. They don't actually change. The data on the ground is the data on the ground. Um, so, no, I would be using the same facts that the governor is using. Um, but I think that the cl conclusions to be drawn from those facts um, really aren't up for debate. Um, I think what's frightening people is that when their leaders say something that doesn't match their experience on the ground, it it should rationally make us concerned and, and make us afraid. So we need to make sure that the policies that we are putting forward as leaders do match the data, do match the facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground are we are still experiencing increases in infection rate. Um, we are still doubling our infection rate um, at a, a uh, at a pace that will overrun our hospital capacity if we don't continue to flatten our curve. So by relying on medical science, we will find ways to adapt that balance our health recovery with our economic recovery because you can't have one without the other. We absolutely have to have a balanced approach. And I think the governor wants a balanced approach. And I would like to help in that. Uh, you mentioned this uh, earlier on in the conversation, the, basically the process by which you announced that uh, you were planning to resign as county judge. Uh, and then COVID uh, happened is, I guess, the, the simplest way to put it. And then you uh, ended up pushing back your, your effective resignation date uh, by a few weeks. Um, can you walk us through what making that decision was like? I'm sure you certainly weren't anticipating having to uh, postpone um, taking that action. Uh, but just for, for everybody on this uh, listening and watching right now, just walk us through what making that decision was like when, when the flu, when the situation was still very fluid. 
you know, um, uh, the entire, well, not the entire team, but most of the emergency response team for the city and the county uh, was in Maryland for a FEMA training uh, at the end of February and the beginning of March. Um, Senator Watson had already said that he would uh, resign. And so I was working through that decision. Do I leave a job that I love? Um, to go to a Senate chamber that is fractious and difficult, um, but is the source of much of our challenges um, as a state. And so I was already in that headspace when we started to see COVID-19 hitting both our East Coast and our West Coast. And um, we declared a disaster while in Maryland. Oh, wow. And by the time we got back to um, back to Travis County, it became clear that we had a much bigger pressing issue in front of us that would require swift action. We didn't yet have any evidence of a COVID-19 positive case in Travis County, mm-hmm. but we knew from what was happening in um, uh, across the globe and uh, and on the east and west coast that we had a limited window of time in which to act. And one thing that we knew we would have to do at least early on is shut down in order to slow down the viral infection because we knew we had to um, prepare our community, prepare our hospitals and prepare our supply chain because they were in no headspace to be able to handle what we knew was coming. So, um, I put my plans for a campaign on hold to throw everything at COVID-19. Um, it, uh, it was, I, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. It wasn't a difficult choice <laughs> when you're faced with a, a global pandemic. Frankly, you drop everything and get moving. Right. So we did. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, uh, you, uh, we've all acknowledged that COVID is not yet, uh, over. We're not past this. And this kind of gets at a reader question from Anne, which is cases, cases, deaths. Uh, those numbers are continuing to rise. And, uh, you know, you have resigned as as county judge to run for higher office. You're still in this emergency management position, which we can talk about after. But Anne uh, is is asking how you justified leaving uh, your, your post as county judge uh, in the middle of a crisis. We have a deep bench in Travis County and the team for emergency response is seasoned um, and I haven't left them. I'm still with them. I may be changing my hat, um, but I'm not going anywhere. Um, I will do this kind of work with or without title and I will do this kind of work with or without pay. Um, This is this is the work. So um, the state response with regard to our health and economic recovery is absolutely crucial. I am not worried about our local response. I feel very confident in our team. I've worked with them for years. I am not so confident in what will happen at the state level to help us get out of this health and economic crisis quicker. I am not as confident that our our state response will minimize unnecessary illness and death. Um, and I think that as a policymaker and a practitioner, I can bring uh, a unique perspective and talent to uh, a team of senators um, to flatten out the curve and get us back to school and back to work in a in a way that adapts to COVID-19. Mm-hmm. While you're campaigning, uh, and this has come up already a couple times, you're, you're serving at the county level in emergency management position under Judge Shambisco. Uh, can you walk us through just what that looks like uh, for the foreseeable future? What are you doing in that role? What is uh, what's your place in uh, continuing to respond to this at the local level? Sure. First of all, I'm so grateful that Judge Bisco would come back. Um, Judge Bisco absolutely radiates calm conf- and confidence. Um, people are 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 feeling so much better <laughs> knowing that Sam is there. Um, Judge Bisco uh, came on board uh, 
uh, in the March time frame, um, I cleared out my office entirely and moved to a little office down the hall and mm-hmm. moved in furniture that was more to Judge Bisco's liking. And he has been in the office since uh, oh. mid-April. Mm-hmm. Um, he has been meeting with all the county executives, preparing for the budget. Our budget is going to be a little nutty this year. Uh, the state's budget is going to be even nuttier. So Judge Bisco took all of the administrative functions of county judge starting mid-April. Um, and I focused on COVID-19. So now here we are mid-May and we've already gotten a good groove. Um, uh, we are meeting regularly, uh, mostly virtually, but we do meet in person once a week in the office at six feet di- distance with masks. <laughs> and also I am staffing him at commissioner's court. Got it. Thank you. And yeah, I have to ask this question just because uh, you mentioned local budget, which sets off something in, in my mind about uh, the conflict brewing on property tax limits. Mm-hmm. Already started seeing a, a bit of debate about that. The Texas Municipal League, for example, thinks that cities and counties can use the old rollback rate of 8% thanks to the disaster declarations that mm-hmm. have uh, happened because of COVID. Um, and Abbott has already said that he disagrees. And, you know, Attorney General Ken Paxton, for his part, says that his office is looking into it. Uh, what do you make of that? Do you think that uh, the city of Austin, uh, if it's not allowed to go back up to the 8% rollback rate and instead uh, stick with the new 3.5% uh, percent election trigger? I mean, is that uh, what does that do for a local government like Austin? Well, again, I'm going to go back to the idea that we really need an all hands on deck approach to this. Um, there's going to be a, a gaping hole in the state budget. There already is because of uh, reduced sales tax and oil and gas revenues. I mean, it is a massive hole in the state budget. Um, but there are also holes in our municipal and county budgets uh, that are pretty significant. Um, but I will say that the major metropolitan counties across the state are the economic engine of the state. And we need to have partnership between the state and these major metro areas. This uh, divide and conquer strategy, this divide, confuse and frighten strategy um, is not is a recipe for continued economic disaster. We must harness the economic power of our major metros in partnership. Um, And so this kind of bickering is not serving us at all. So um, would you like to go to the budget question? Because I'd like to I'd like to jump on budget. This seems like a good segue. Is that okay, Cassie? Go ahead. So as I look at the budget, um, we, we do have real structural problems at the state level. Um, there is a rainy day fund that has we'll probably have about eight billion dollars in it. And then there's also federal stimulus money, CARES Act money that's come into the state uh, that is also uh, the state's portion of pass through is probably about eight or nine billion. But still, both of those pots of money are one time dollars. They are emergency dollars. They are not ongoing revenue. Um, So we are going to need to uh, get to a place at the state level and exert some discipline to put one time dollars to one time needs and then ongoing revenues to ongoing needs. Um, We are going to need to pop the, you know, pop the hood and get down into the engine block of the budget to fix some of these things that have been kicked down the, the, the road for too long. Now, I have that kind of experience. The legislature meets every other year and it's major deliverable as a budget. Uh, but counties pass a balanced budget every single year. So every year for 11 years, I've been in negotiations for the county budget. For five years, I have um, presided over that budget. Every year it's balanced. Every year we stretch diminishing dollars across competing interests to provide health care, to provide public safety, to provide justice, to provide parks, roads and emergency response, as we've seen. Right. We do this even though we have unfunded mandates from the state. We do it even though we have irrational revenue caps from the state. And curiously, even Senator Betancourt has praised Travis County's budgeting process. So I would like to take some of that to the Senate. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, 
uh, this is I know that we're running out of time here, so I wanted to fit a few more questions in. Um, if you're successful, either in, in July or in a runoff, if you end up in the Texas Senate, what plans uh, do you have to help uh, Texas Democrats up and down the ballot? Uh, you know, you're going to be uh, in a new role at the state level. Uh, do you have predictions on how Democrats do this fall in a presidential year? Uh, do you have plans to uh, help House Democrats who are uh, either seeking reelection or seeking a House seat? Yes, all of that. And the best campaign strategy of all for the Democrats is governing well. Absolutely far and away. The way we win hearts and minds is by governing really well, doing the work and making progress for Texans. So absolutely, we need to get the vote out. Absolutely, we need to fund campaigns. Absolutely, we need a, a strong party and we need to govern well. Got it. Thank you. I want to fit in a couple more reader questions here. Uh, this one is from Linda. Uh, what are your ideas about solving the so-called uh, quote unquote water wars mm -hmm. in Bastrop County with multiple uh, mass permit demands on their slow recharging aquifer shared by other counties. Uh, does Austin's pro growth policies conflict with the needs of uh, your would be Bastrop constituents? Yes. The answer is yes. And that's what makes this district particularly energizing for me is because we do have the uh, both urban and rural interests here. And we do have a very precious resource, which is our groundwater and our surface water. We have the Colorado River running right through the middle of both of the counties. And then uh, Travis County is dry, whereas Bastrop County is wet because Travis is over the Trinity and Bastrop is over the Carrizo Wilcox. So I have been, uh, you know, in the saddle for years, literally <laughs> um, working with Bastrop County and Travis County and also other surrounding counties to solve that conundrum. Um, we're all in this together. Uh, our economic uh, well-being is is um, is interdependent and it is absolutely interdependent on our water resources. So we need to. Just as I've said before, irrespective of what our differing positions are, we need to identify what we agree on and we need to get to the table and stay at the table until we can figure out how to make progress in a way that's effective, efficient and fair for everyone today. But more importantly, for future generations, if we squander this resource, that is that is the ultimate in sin. Mm -hmm. We squander this resource and my children and your children and their children don't have water in the future. We will have failed, absolutely failed. Thank you. Uh, one last question again uh, from uh, another uh, listener on this uh, interview. His name's Christopher. Uh, today is my 40th birthday and all of your 52 years. Uh, what is your biggest achievement yet in public office? I added the public office part, but I, I suppose you could answer it uh, both ways if you'd like. Well, first of all, I'm I'm 55. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm 55. But happy birthday, Chris. <laughs> um, Honestly, <laughs> the big double nickel, man. Um, I, I my proudest accomplishments. Um, you know, I, I will confess that I have a hard time coming up with accomplishments lists because once I'm done, I move to the next thing. Um, but where I'm most proud is when I've been confronted by a difficult problem, uh, sometimes that had a, a recent fail and figured out through partnership how to get around that obstacle and and make some progress. So I, I am I am proud that when our bond election for much needed court capacity failed, um, we, you know, we licked our wounds, learned our lessons and then came up with another location that was better and a funding plan that was cheaper for the Travis County taxpayer. So that was cool. Uh, another area where I was particularly proud is we've been fighting over a public defender's office for decades literally decades. And then I saw a moment where we might be able to run through a window of opportunity to get a public defender's office for the first time. And it was hard 
And oh my God, the, the long knives came out. It was, you know, the judges were fighting with the prosecutors who were fighting with the activists who were fighting with the, uh, the capital area private defender service. Uh, uh, the trust was low. Uh, but we stayed at the table. We would not leave until we figured out how to move forward. And, and we stayed at the table with the state. Um, and the state came through for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm really proud of that, too. Thank you. And uh, happy birthday, Christopher. Thanks for the question. Um, that is all the time we have uh, with uh, uh, Judge Eckhart today. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, and thank you to everyone who supported today's event. And, um, of course, thank you, Judge, for being here uh, for today's interview. Um, if you want to become a Texas Tribune member and support our public service journalism, go to texastribune.org slash give. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. We will see you next time. Support the press, y'all. We need the press. So thank you very much, Cassie. Thank you, Judge.